my name is Dan Clark, uh, originally born in upstate New York, Oswego, New York, um, which uh, is what Lake Oswego is named after, if you were wondering. Oswego is Iroquois for uh, Ashwega, is pouring out place. It's where the Oswego River empties into Lake Ontario. Uh, it's more probably commonly known for the 13 feet of snow, uh, average snowfall every year. Um, I am joined uh, tonight uh, by my family, my lovely wife Kim and my son Sam. Uh, I'm contractually obligated to display a picture of Kim with brown hair, uh, so we've got that there for you. Um, I've got a master's in instructional design from Syracuse University and just finished up a doctorate in adult education from North Dakota State. My family and I have been all throughout the country uh, doing distance ed kind of things. Uh, that's also why I'm here at Western and we um, restarted what used to be called the Center for Teaching and Learning. It's now the Center for Academic Innovation, the facility you're sitting in, uh, sitting in now. So that's a little bit about me. Some ground rules before we get started. And we'll make them pretty simple, right? Number one is be loud, right? If you, have, if you want to stop me, stop me. If you've got an opinion, please state your opinion, right? We want this to be as much of a dialogue as it is a brain dump, okay? Because be loud because you are the experts. We've got some faculty in here. I don't know, high school teachers, faculty, some students, community members, whatever, right? So you guys all have a stake in some of these things. You all have opinions. You know, go ahead and stop me at any, uh, at any point because you are the experts. And most of all, you have fun. And I, I don't embarrass Sam with that picture, but um, that was the birthday party with the giant slip and slide down the side hill. And that moment in time right there, um, Sam was laughing about as hard as you could ever hear a kid laugh. I mean, he was just enjoying himself so much, right? Just so absorbed in the moment. And that's why I always use that picture, because I think it's good for us to remember, you know, that things need to be enjoyable. As far as what I promise you, no BS bingo. If you hear me leveraging any paradigms, you can go ahead and raise your hand and catch me in that, right? This is not about making things complicated. It's hopefully about making things simple. So none of the fancy words. Hey, yeah, probably maybe transparency, maybe community. I'll try not to use the fancy words, I promise. One little, I do like to give a little sort of hint about best practices, okay? And basically in that they're really a misnomer, particularly in this field. We are still growing in the field. You know, the technology continues to increase. Instructional design theories, teaching and learning theories, theories about the brain, right? These, these things are all growing. So when somebody talks to you in a lecture like this and starts talking about best practices, I would argue that maybe um, you take that kind of with a grain of salt, because we don't know. We have principles of good practice. We have good ideas. We have things that we're trying to research all the time and follow up on. But I would really um, shy away from somebody that's maybe trying to sell you on some best practices. And there's some simple reasons for that. Right? Best practices or practices or what make good practices are contextually based. Things that are good at Western Oregon University with an enrollment of about 5,300 may not work so well at Utah Valley University with an enrollment more like 40,000. Certainly some of the things that Dave King is doing down at uh, Oregon eCampus or they're doing at University of Phoenix might not fit at a school uh, such as Western. Central Wyoming College, where one of my a collaborator and, and partner of mine uh, works. Again, that's a, um, that's a community college, right? So again, it's contextually based. So when you talk about best practices, it's really, I'm trying to convince you not to use the term best practices. The other thing about best practices is they ought to be temporally based, okay? Those three men uh, are all in the Football Hall of Fame. And as you can see from the pictures, they're all using very different techniques for blocking as an offensive offensive linemen. That's Mel Hine, Jim Otto, and Jonathan Ogden. Okay? So what was great, a great best practice even five years ago might not be a best practice now. Right? So again, we talk about principles of good practice, good ideas, and because we're all still learning about this stuff, that's why it's so important that everybody kind of get involved. And again, we talk about have fun. Guys, this is a lot of work. Trying to keep up with this stuff. You guys uh, dedicating your evening to come and listen to this stuff. And it's going to be a lot of things, words you probably never heard of, and concepts you hadn't even thought of. And sometimes, oh my god, it's just so much. How can I keep up with it? And the hope is that you remember, it's work, but it's good work. And this is a quote um, by my godfather and my uncle, who, who recently passed away. And he always used to say, the more effort it takes, the more of you there is in it. 
And I always try to remember that because, again, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of thought and it's a lot of effort, but hopefully it's good work and hopefully we'll see it, uh, hopefully we'll see our students benefit from us. A little bit of an apology. I was telling some of you there's 118 slides. We've got uh, 52 more minutes, 42 if I let you guys ask any questions, right? So this is a little bit of a brain dump. Some of this stuff is going to come a little rapid fire at you. Okay? If you have any questions related to any of this stuff, again, we'll, we'll wrap it up at the end. And I please ask you to contact me, and I'll provide you any of the articles or videos that I reference. You'll, if I do my job, you will leave this presentation with more questions than when you came. Okay? It's, again, we're going, to kick, we're going to kick around a bunch of topics. We're going to ask a bunch of questions. And if I've done my job, you'll be less certain when you left as when you, as when you showed up. And exercise I always do, and it's about perspectives, right? So from the top, okay, somebody tell me which way the dancer is spinning, clockwise or counterclockwise, if you look down at the top of her. Clockwise. clockwise. Anybody? Whoa, wait a minute. No, you're out. Can anybody make her do this I'm working on with her foot? And the trick is kind of focus here. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, what just happened? Right? OK. And uh, um, there, there's a name. I, I forget what the name for this effect is. But the point I'm trying to make is about perspectives, right? Everybody has their own personal perspective. What's, works, what's true for some person might not be true for another person. Again, in the context, you make your move. Oh, the other thing. So if you, if you close your eyes and think about her spinning the other way and open your eyes, you can get her to move that way too. Is that working for anybody? The real crazy people can get her to do this, <laughs> the foot mounting back and forth. But again, we all have different perspectives, and that's what makes us, that's what makes the, the community, that's what makes the conversation stronger. So with that being said, do we have any last words? We haven't even started on the presentation yet. So any last words? All right, so let's get going. Right? And somebody been, somebody's been at my bubble gum. But normally in any of my workshops, the person that gets the pop culture reference gets a treat. So for better or worse, right, you may want to keep your mouth completely closed. Or if you like bubble gum, uh, we'll, try and, we'll try and reward you for some. Uh, Edward Smith, uh, captain of the Titanic. All right, so let's get going. I want to talk to you tonight about Web 2.0, right? Does anybody know what Web 2.0 is? Oh, good. I'm going to call on you in a second, right? Poor Lucy here wants to know what the hell happened to Web 1.0, right? We're already working on Web 2.0. What's Web 2.0? Okay, get, we get that? We agree with that? Anybody disagree with that? Okay. Yes, generally, right? So here's, here's kind of the easiest way to think about things. Web 1.0 was a dissemination tool. There was people who held the knowledge, and they used Web 1.0 to disseminate that knowledge out to users. With a, three, uh, with a thing we're going to call free, or we're going to talk about quite often tonight, freeform syntax, these are the tools that now empowers the community to build knowledge. So you see down here in Web 2.0, at Web 1.0, it was one direction. and Web 2.0, it's multi-direction. So it's about the social construction of knowledge, or the social construction of content, let's say. That's the real key to Web 2.0. We got that one? There's going to be a test. Anybody? Web 3.0? Web 3.0? They're still arguing about what they're going to call web or what is going to comprise web 3.0. Number one is something that we're actually kind of creeping towards already, and that's a semantic web. Okay? Do you guys remember Boolean searches? You know, look for Dan plus Clark. If you didn't know if I had an E at the end, or if you didn't know you'd use the quotes or not use the quotes, right? Now, how do you look stuff up? Hey, who's this cat, Dan Clark? Right? You, ask the, you ask the Oracle, that's Google, right? You ask the Oracle, and that's, that's a semantic web. That's a semantic search so that the web starts to, build, uh, starts to build those linkages. The other thing that may or may not evolve into what they call Web 3.0 is a more spatial web. Okay? If, and you'll see, oh, I was going to put an example up there. You can look at websites where they've taken a, a thousand pictures of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and they've built a mosaic out of it. 
right? And for every picture, every piece of the building you see, you can also see where and when the picture was taken from. Okay, so this idea of a spatial web. But honestly, I think more of the semantic web. When people are going to start talking about 3.0, we're already moving that way with our semantic search capabilities. Okay? I really encourage you, we probably don't have time, in fact, I'm sure we don't have time tonight to talk about this. This is a guy named Mike Wesch from Kansas State. And he put out a couple of little YouTube videos. Uh, one is called The Machine is Us. Uh, and again, if you send me an email, I'd be happy to send you the link. Okay? And what he's talking about is freeform syntax. And he's talking about the tools that allow us to create Web 2.0. And we'll talk a little bit about those um, uh, a little bit later. And he says, if you ever hear this guy speak, he's got a great uh, story about uh, him creating this, um, him creating this little web, I'm sorry, this little video, and having it take off. Having it go viral is what we call it now. Five, six years ago when he created this, that's not what they called it. So um, the machine is us. A really good video that uh, uh, describes this thing called freeform syntax. Uh, and again, the freeform syntax and how the web is being built. And without being able to show it to you tonight, basically, he says at the end, we need to rethink a few things. Okay? We need to rethink copyright, authorship, identity, ethics, aesthetics, rhetoric, private, a lot of, we need to rethink a lot of things because we have democratized information and democratized knowledge. So that was his point about the machine is us. Not long after, he came out with a video called A Vision of Students Today. You can Google that one. Go ahead and send me an email. I'll send you the link. And this was, the, the cool thing about this was, this was his um, class at Kansas State. They basically put a, have you seen these? Right? He put together, uh, he put together, they put together a video. And they all hold up these little signs, and some of them hold up a computer and whatever else. And they're basically saying, what are students like today? And, and the implication is, how are students today unlike what faculty assume students are like? Right? So here's one. I complete 49% of the readings assigned me. Frankly, that seemed a little high. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the other one, one, one of the real powerful ones was, uh, you know, I write X hundred words in terms of formal book, uh, reports and, 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 and essays and thousands and thousands of words commenting on blogs and everything else. Right? So again, if you've not seen it, um, that's a pretty good one as well. And, and part of the cool point about that one is again, the students built this video. It was in his class, but they built this artifact, so it's kind of cool. Just Google a vision of students today. Then, <laughs> not a, a couple years later, and now it's already a couple years ago, you see Mike saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's not all about the technology after all. He really rethought, uh, because the, the, the um, the vision of students today video, and then his touring sort of lecture lecturing behind that video was very very pro technology, and he really wanted faculty members and teachers to get involved in using all the technology. A couple years later, he says, eh, "Back up the bus," and really, and, and I'm sure this article is still available. I can send it to you if not. What he's talking about here is we want to be careful about drinking the technology Kool Aid, and we want to be careful about considering technology as a silver bullet. Technology is not going to solve the issue. If you have issues in your classroom, technology is not going to solve them. Okay? Technology is a great tool, right? and it, it, it can be a democratizing tool. It can be a lot of useful things, but it's not the silver bullet that's going to solve issues in your classroom. So he says, you know, back up the bus a little bit on that, because it's not about technology. Okay? It's about Luis. You didn't know this was about Luis? Huh? I'm glad. Right? What? Wait a minute, what? This is about Luis. Trust me. This is the one you remember. It's not about technology, it's about Luis. Because it's about literacy, ubiquity, immediacy, and social presence. That's called a mnemonic. So it's the, the thing that'll help you measure. So those, uh, remember, those are the four things that we'll spend the rest of our time uh, kicking around a little bit and exploring. Literacy, ubiquity, immediacy, and social presence. And more, and more precisely, how new technologies and the web have influenced these things quite a bit, and, what, and, and then how these things influence our students. So let's talk about literacy. Would somebody like to define literacy for me? Ms. come. Nobody wants to take a shot at defining literacy? Besides. Okay. Well, that's functional literacy. Sure, that's functional literacy. If you ask my father, 
um, who was born in like 1938, what a literate man looked like, right? My father could recite uh, Friends, Romans, Countrymen. What was that? Mark Antony to the, out of which I should know Shakespeare, it. Shakespeare, I think. What's Shakespeare, but I don't know. It's Caesar, right? Mark, Friends, Romans, Countrymen, lend me your ears. He could recite the whole damn darn thing, sorry, right? Moby Dick. Have you read Moby Dick? Don't lie. Have you read Moby Dick? How many of those old folks have read Moby Dick, <laughs> right? Right? So, uh, you know, and literacy, libraries, right? Is that what literacy is? 50 years ago, that's what literacy is, okay? Well, can you get away with, instead of reading Moby Dick, you read Henry Potter? I've read all those, too. You read, yeah, you've read those. Now, technically, have, has anybody noticed anything about this image? Those aren't actually the book covers. Those are the, movie. Those are the movie covers. Okay, well, I, well, now I've watched the movie based on the book, and they were thick books, so they're kind of like Moby. Is that literacy? I don't know the answer to that. I'm just saying, literacy is moving, right? Is literacy just about being a really smart guy, right? Dude could make a radio out of a coconut, right? Really, really smart guy. Is that literacy? I don't know. Is being a really smart guy literacy? Okay, I don't know the answers to this, okay? Is literacy being able to work with your hands? Okay, so okay. to heck. So you just gave us examples. You had to know who those pop culture figures were when you were asking the questions. So. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, oh, go hold that thought. Hold that thought for three minutes. Can you hold that thought for three minutes? Because this is going to be good. Oh, I like this, right? How about working with your hands, okay? How about St. Francis of Assisi, right? Have you ever seen this quote? All right. Oh, that's a good one, right? Being an artist. Well, except, is it Frank, uh, is it St. Francis of Assisi or is it some dude named Louis Neiser? I don't know. Google told me it was both. So we'll get back to that as well. So is literacy the art of, do you have to be able to create something to be literate? I don't know. If you, this is called a word cloud. We'll talk about these in a, well, actually, we'll talk about these in a second, right? When you do a word cloud about literacy, these are some of the words that come up. OK, interesting. What do you think Mike Wesch says about literacy? He says literacy is now moving from knowledgeable to knowledge able. Now, when you see the term knowledge able, does it conjure up any particular entities? Anything come to mind when you talk about knowledge able? Action. Oh, that's interesting. How about that? I don't need to know it because I can Google it. I can ask the Oracle or I can ask Wikipedia. Okay, yeah. Isn't literacy very topical related? Could be. And also very chronologically, if you were literate in the 1500s, you knew something. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of variables in literacy. Right, of course. And that's, that's part of what we're getting at is, is the technology is doing nothing but accelerating kind of those variables, right? So. What happens to the old literacy? Oh, that I'd love to know. That I would love to know, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a conversation about it, because it comes back to your point in just a second. So bear with me. Okay? Is this literacy? Does anybody know what this is? Technically what that is? Well, actually it's that, but technically it's presented as a, it's a tweet. 140 or 144 characters in Twitter. Now, very good, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. You didn't know that. You didn't know that, right? Because you weren't forced to, to learn it, right? Okay. Is that literacy? I don't know. And, and I would argue, I'm pretty proud of distilling. I, I made the tweet. I'm pretty proud of distilling Lincoln's Gettysburg Address down into a tweet. That was hard to do, right? Um, word clouds, okay? If you're familiar, Wordle is a, is a free app, W-O-R-D-L-E. I don't think it's .com, but if you just Google Wordle, it'll come up, okay? The size of a word represents what? Does anybody know how word cloud works? Frequency, right? The more it's said, the bigger it gets, okay, in the word cloud, okay? It's a little bit dated, but, uh, well, it's pretty obvious if you look, right? This is one of the debates. This is one of, this is uh, President Obama, and this is Senator McCain in a debate um, whenever, whenever that 
election was. Okay. Now, if you look at going, think, now, okay, the idea is that you can look at the blue word cloud and see more action-oriented words. You can look at the red word cloud and see, supposedly, you can see more spending. Senator is big, very, very title, right? Um, so the red one is more formal and the blue one is more action-oriented. I personally don't see that, okay, but is that a form of literacy? I don't know. Is that a, is that a new form of literacy? Memes. Is that literacy? I don't know the answer. I know they're funny. What's it? Oh, these guys, these guys love it because these knows what these are, right? We know what these guys are, right? What's she called? Overly, Overly attached girlfriend, right? You got the aliens guy. Uh, you got the too much, uh, too damn high guy. <laughs> the most interesting man in the world. Um, and then this is success boy or something, right? These guys all have names. Okay, is that literacy? I don't know. They're funny, um, and you can certainly uh, you can go and create you can create your own. They have word or uh, uh, meme engines and things like that. There's all kinds of this stuff out there. Okay, there's all kinds of different things we can talk about when we talk about literacy, and they're changing all the time. Back to Daryl's point, though, Ken, how does literacy affect communication? And you made a very great point. Okay, in that I've showed you, I don't know how many dozen slides so far, and there's about four words on them. Okay, so the communication I'm sort of purposely, as an example, uh, uh, engaged in is all metaphoric. If we don't have a shared, if you want to call it a cultural canon or a literal canon, you don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, some of them are easy, some of them are the geeky guy on Big Bang, right? Some of them are a little more esoteric. You guys ever? Gilgan's Island, is that still on a rerun? You never heard of the dude, right? Right? <laughs> okay. Right, so I, um, uh, Marlon Brando as Mark Antony, right? That's a, that's a literal reference, okay? And is the meaning lost when I try to transmit some sort of meaning by way of references that we don't share? I have no idea what the answer to that is, but I think it's a really, really interesting question. So you've got War and Peace guy. Right from the good old days, okay, and you got Irma Gerd girl, okay. How do we communicate? We can certainly communicate literally, but then you talk about sex and, uh, text and subtext, right? So is the implication missing? All right, are the metaphors useful? I don't know, but it's an interesting to think about. Anything else on literacy before we plow on? Let's talk about ubiquity. Okay, this is Neil Young, and I have, a, I have an album at, at home, one of his concert albums, and I, it's probably staged, but it's really funny. Um, they're warming up for the set, and somebody out in the stands yells, it all sounds the same. And Neil Young walks up to the microphone, and he says, well, it's all one song, right? So they, it's all one thing, and that's really ubiquity. You guys, you know, the old story, you guys see the old story about the stack your phones in the middle of the, of the dining room table, and the first one to look buys? Right? I mean, we expect, my God, if the internet goes down here, if wireless goes down on this campus, people freak out. Ten minutes, freak out. You take uh, the Wii U away from that guy for, for two hours, it's not pretty. Right? Because he's going to make you suffer because you've taken away his, the, 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 the technology that he has come to expect to be ubiquitous. Okay, 1994. Now this is cool because this is now on a new ad, right? 1994, right? 20 years ago. What is internet? What is internet, right? All right so what is internet? Just in case any of you want to make a bar bet, huh? It's not a dump truck. It's not a dump truck. Is that the? <laughs> the senator said that at one point. <laughs> That's see. We're not communicating, right? Because we don't share a cultural canon. Um, that's webs and cloud, clouds. Do you know what the internet is, technically? Anybody? Piece of gum. The internet is the hardware. The internet technically is the wires, servers, switches, nodes. The World Wide Web is the stuff on the internet. It's sort of a distinction without a difference, but in case you want to win a bar bet. 
Uh, and then, of course, the, the concept of clouds, right? We've moved away from a, we've moved away from this idea that we have to own stuff, we have to own our servers, we have to keep them in a server room and keep them cool. It's out on the cloud, right? You know, so Amazon has cloud servers all over the place. And, and so we've, we've given up ownership out to the giant cloud of, of servers and things that are not physically co-located. They're just out on the internet. They're not out on the web, they're out on the internet. Like their content is out on the web. <coughs> anyways, a little bit of trivia for you there anyways. So of course, the, matter, the, the, the idiom is we have the world at our fingers. Now what do we do with it? We post pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. That's what we do with the world. That I, you know, that's what I do the same thing. You know, I, I look on Imgur and Imager, however you want to say it, and look at all the funny memes and whatever else. That's a great quote, and it's it's been reused. You probably can't um, attribute it to anybody. Okay, you have the world's knowledge, right there, right, right there, and we're posting pictures of cats and getting into arguments with strangers. Now we're up to 2004. Texting comes around in 2003, okay? I have, it's back there on my desk, I still have the old fashioned Captain Kirk phone, right? And people text me all the time and I beg them. It's like you don't understand, beep, 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 boop, boop, boop. You don't understand how hard it is for me to reply to your text. Please don't text me. Send me an email because I've got an iPad, something. But, but again, texting has been, become commonplace, right? Killing genuine human interaction two thumbs at a time, okay? Now we get things like this. Now we get a little bit of a backlash. Call your mother. <laughs> Talk to each other. Pretend it's 1993. Okay, interesting. Because with ubiquity, we expect what? In McDonald's, we expect what? Free Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. <laughs> and I, I do the same thing, right? Uh, I got a cup of coffee at McDonald's this morning. Oh, go, oh, they got Wi-Fi here. Because we expect it. Because technology is ubiquitous. We always expect to be connected to this thing. I used to talk about, of course, uh, shows you how dated some of these slides are, right? The, President Bush talked about the axis of evil, and we used to talk about the real axis of evil was Facebook, uh, Wikipedia, and cell phones. Texting Wikipedia and Facebook was the real axis of, of evil. Well, now things have gotten a little more complicated. And I was going to look up for you, and I should have looked up. The, you, can, you can look it up. The, the rate at which these apps are being created is just astounding. Absolutely astounding. They're flying, you know, they're flying at us at, a, at an incredible pace. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff we can do out there in terms of ubiquitous connection. Mm -hmm. Ubiquity. We buy, right? We got Wi-Fi and McDonald's. We can pretty much agree that the internet technologies are ubiquitous. Immediacy. And in a minute, we're going to get back to Luis. You're going to love it. Right? Anybody, bubble gum? Anybody? Huh? Yeah, but who's, what's her name? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Veruca Salt, I want the world, I want the whole world, I don't care how, I want it now. Uh, any of you guys go to Yeasty Beastie? We all go to Yeasty Beastie, right? Tuesday or Wednesday night is their trivia night, okay? You know what they tell you? And I, you know, I've, I've gone, been going to trivia nights at bars for a long time. And apparently it had been a while since I'd been to one, right? Because you go to East DBC when I first got here a couple of years ago, what do they tell you to do? Put the cell phone away, right? Well, why would you put that? And that's not trivia, right? It's, it's I'm capable of typing, right? typing capacity, right? Anybody ask directions anymore? Nobody asks directions. Our new car does it right for you. Turn left. Well, recalculating, right? Because you should have turned left back there, right? Um, ask Jeeves, and now it's called Ask, right? It's just, and again, this is back to the semantic web, right? Hey, what's the, um, one of the, uh, one of my little uh, sort of pet projects is um, Division I, particularly football mascots. So if you name a Division I college, I can name the mascot for you, okay? It, is an, it was always a useless ability, but now it's even more useless because now all you got to do is ask Jeeves. Right? It's not, you know, it's no, there's no tri almost no trivia anymore. Cha-Cha, we'll talk about Cha-Cha in a second. I'm not even sure that Cha-Cha still exists, but there's a real interesting story about it. And then this one, I, I added this. 
I've not yet seen this movie, but it's supposed to be pretty good. This is one of those uh, Siri. So the guy falls, the guy creates Siri and then falls in love with her, right? And I saw a meme, and I almost added it today. I saw one of those text deals, and it said, uh, what, who's, the, uh, who's Min Windows Siri? Is it Corsica? Yeah, yeah, something, uh, Cortana, right? <laughs> and and uh, Cortana, how do I get to pizza place or whatever? That's Siri. Who's Cortana? Oh, sorry, sorry. Siri, how do I get to pizza place? You better ask Cortana. <laughs> anyway, just humor. But yeah, right, these things talk to us now. They give us directions now. The cars give us directions. I mean, again, it's immediate information. Back to Wikipedia. Where is our easiest place to get quick information is Wikipedia, OK? I don't know. It always seemed a little fishy to me. I don't know, right? So here's the deal. When Wikipedia first came out in the mid to late 90s, there was real doubt about, you know, this is a joke, but this idea of, is it real? What's the veracity of it? You know, can, can, can it be counted on? You guys, I'm sure, you better have, you don't cite Wikipedia. Who's got that rule? At least two, don't cite Wikipedia, OK? You can cheat, you scroll down to the very bottom, find out what <laughs> You can do that. This is Rick Riley. Rick Riley used to write the last page, the article on the last page of Sports Illustrated. And he writes one about cha-cha. And again, I can send you the link if you send me an email. Cha-cha was a thing where you would text a, a question to a number. And so, does it still exist? No, you don't know or no, it doesn't exist. It All right. So you text, a, uh, you text a question to cha-cha and somebody would answer it. Well, here's Rick Riley. He's a sports writer. He signed up to be a cha-cha operator. And basically, they get paid a nickel an answer. OK? A nickel an answer. And so he. He tells the story in this article. He's making it up. He doesn't. Oh, yeah, it's this. OK, good. He got his nickel, right? There's no, there's no fact checking to cha-cha, right? Think about the rate at which data flows at us. OK, this isn't the best example I could find. But even if you watch ESPN today, the scores are up one side. The news is down the other, right? And don't forget, even the game has all these little things. The other thing I wanted to bring up is, it's a new thing about this, this story was first broken by so-and-so. This is a new thing, right? Immediacy, immediacy. The immediacy of the information is becoming more important than its veracity. The first one I hear about is the one we're going to go with, OK? There's some reasons for this, right? There's, there's, there's things that have facilitated this immediacy. Moore's law is that the size of a, uh, the size of a transistor is re uh, reduced by half I think it's every one year, OK? These are a little, this is a phone microchip, OK? Who, who's good at math? How many times more? How many times bigger is this one than this one? A thousand. thousand, right. Well, if you do the, the actual, oh, right. Megabytes to gig. Yeah, mag to gig. OK, the first PC that I bought from my home, I think, was The first PC that I bought might have been 500 meg or something. I mean, you know, you look back at these things, and it, it, uh, technology is so cheap. Technology is cheap means we can get more faster. So that no, no pun intended with Moore's law, right? So the technology provides us more faster. Now, there are some folks that say, we have been trained to have this sort of short attention span theater. Quick, quick, quick. Three minute little blurbs. Kids are all ADHD, right? Anybody want to know what it's blamed on? Screen. Huh? Screen. Luis. Sesame Street in 1969 comes out with these three minute, everything's three minutes long, a lot of colors, a lot of the, the Muppets are all these bright colors. I'm not saying that I subscribe to this theory, but the thought is that this was the first, this was the first evidence of this sort of consumer culture of getting stuff immediately and getting stuff in small bits. Hmm? Could be. Yeah. Uh, we had to tie it back to Luis. There's our guy Luis there, right? Nick Carr, uh, he's famous for, he, he wrote a book and an article called Why IT Doesn't Matter. Uh, he came out with this one um, a few years ago. It's a little bit of pseudoscience, but he's sort of supposing some of the same things we're talking about here. What does this do to our brains? 
right? And again, I'm exactly as old as Sesame Street. So, right, so we needed Mr. Rogers to cool out, right? Because we had Sesame Street going fast and hard, and then Mr. Rogers, ah, right? Has it changed us? I, you know, I don't know. He thinks so. And we all know what happens when immediacy is more important than veracity, right? And we also all know, if you want it, look it up on the internet. <laughs> okay, sweetie, that's not Abraham I Lincoln. Know it's mine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, there you go. Immediacy. The veracity, I'm sorry, the immediacy of the information has become at least as important as it's. Nobody fact checks, as I guess. They apologize. They seem to all apologize, but nobody really fact checks. Social presence is kind of the newest thing that I've added to this. And this is really um, interesting as well to me. This is, talks about the effects now. Because remember, Web 2.0, we are all content creators. Okay? And what are some of the effects of that new situation on our kids and our social presence? In the beginning, there were blogs. Everybody had a blog. Oops. Everybody had a blog. Right? Does anybody want to take a guess? Another pop culture reference? Two, two pieces of bubble gum. Who was the first blogger? Steve Jobs. Uh -uh. That lady loser. How about? <laughs> <laughs> was he not the first blogger? Am I crazy here, right? <laughs> OK. The first blogger, right? Then blogs became like noses. Everybody had one, OK? Little House in the Valley, North Dakota Life Through the Eyes of an East Coast Girl was my wife's blog. She must have known this was coming because she just snuck out. Okay. Well, Wheaton had a blog. One of the first really hilarious ones was this guy, Paul Shirley. He was an end of the bench NBA guy. And he just spilled it all about what the locker rooms were like and what some of these NBA stars were like. That was one of the, I don't know if you can see the date up there. Here you go, 05. That was one of the first gotta read. The, I mean, this is some crazy stuff. Here's an interesting one. We know who this is. Nope. You don't know who that is? Yeah. Roger Ebert. What's important, what's important about his blog? Anybody want to venture a guess of what's important about Roger Ebert's blog? Hmm? Roger Ebert lost his jaw to cancer. And he, and he lost the ability to speak from some point several years ago. He just died a couple years ago. He continued. And in fact, his blog is still there. His website's still there. You can still look at uh, movie reviews, that obviously, that he's not doing. But he continued, his voice continued long past his ability to actually speak. Okay. Now, again, we, we talk about text blogs. There's video blogs and podcasts and YouTube posts and all of this stuff, right? So everybody had a blog. Leave who alone? Who's this guy? It's Chris somebody. Leave Brittany alone, right? You're all picking on poor Brittany, right? I'm like, okay, all right. Okay. So, what's that? This one? I don't know. It might be. I don't know where I got the picture. Would it be bad if it was? Would it be inappropriate if it was? I could take it out. It's not inappropriate. Oh, okay. An interesting time. Right, right. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about that that time. Keys to the kingdom. What made this possible? Number one is technology. Okay. Everybody, every single thing on that piece of paper is now where? In your phone. Every capability. Huh? Well, no, but every single thing that all those things could do, you are carrying around on your phone. Think about the power. Think about how fast we can post those pictures, those cat pictures. Right? Again, Moore's Law, okay? The technology growth is exponential. It's kind of funny uh, that the, phones, the phone size has turned around, if you've noticed that, mm -hmm. right? Smaller, 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 smaller. What was the, um, there's a skit in Zoolander, right? That's a, that's a, oh, who's, um, Ben Stiller, right? And he's a model, and his phone is like this big, and that's like a sight gag. Well, now they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's kind of, kind of interesting. But it's about technology. Everything on, every, I should have added up what that cost, but now you get it in your phone, okay? And it's about freeform syntax. Freeform syntax is kind of what you mentioned. That allows you to create HTML, XML, 
HTML5 without knowing a thing about it. These are the blog creation tools, right? You can create a blog without knowing a thing about HTML because you've got these interfaces. You type it in there and it, it'll, you can tell it to make it green, you can tell it to make it blank, you can tell it all kinds of things. That's called freeform syntax. And it's a key, it's kind of, it's not a term that people might know, but that's a key development in the democratization of the web because everybody can do it now. Blogs provided a sense of place. Their home on the web. Here's welcome to my world. Welcome to so and so's home on the web. Right? So somebody didn't need to know the, the coding, and yet they could carve out a space on the web. Okay? So it's really important that blogs created this sense of space. And by, when I say blogs, by extension, the video stuff and all of that stuff. Your social presence can kind of carve out this space on the web. Also gives you a safe uh, sense of voice. What's he saying? Worst movie ever. Worst episode ever, right? You have your voice. You can put, you're, you're now published, right? And there's this weird thing I'm saying, there's, there's this weird thing that seems to occur now that everybody is published, OK? So I don't even know, anybody know the guy's name? I don't know his name. He's just comic book guy. Comic book guy, right? Um, so his opinion is very, very important now. Okay? Think about, think about, um, let me take a step back. It's important to think about Web 2.0 as a chorus of voices, not as lonely comic book store owner in his room, stereotypically, but a chorus of voices. And here's an example I want to give. NPR 2007 did a study, and this is back in the days where we didn't know if, if uh, Wikipedia really was the evil empire. Um, so they did, and the uh, science, um, the magazine Science did a similar study. So basically, NPR goes out onto Wikipedia, and they look up, they just do a simple word count of Shakespeare. Okay, and in 2007, in April 2007, Shakespeare was 7,400 words about Shakespeare. Then they did another search. Anybody want to guess? More or less? More. More. 95, uh, 97, 54. Now, there are two lessons to be learned here. And one is, when I say that the, the web has democratized knowledge, that's not entirely true, right? It is overly weighted towards people who use it, OK, and less weighted, by definition, um, by people who don't use it, OK? But a neat thing happened. After April 2007, they did this NPR, a little, one of their little three-minute little blurbs like Sesame Street. And they said, you know, oh, we're not sure about Wikipedia because, look, you know, the geeks own Wikipedia and they care more about lightsabers than they do about Shakespeare. Look what happens in October. It's self-correcting, right? It's self-correcting because it's about a chorus of voices. In the aggregate, okay, Wikipedia comes out okay. And you've heard people that, you know, you, you hear, you know, dropping hand grenades in Wikipedia. Oh, there was one, I just read it the other day. Somebody got into, somebody got backstage at a band concert because they went into Wikipedia, changed the thing and made them an, a, a relative <laughs> and showed that to the bouncer and they got in. Uh, pretty creative, right? But uh, immediately somebody said, hey, that's not right. And they kind of, and the other study, I didn't put it up there, I think it was Science Magazine. Uh, Wikipedia, even back then in, in the late aughts, was just as um, correct as Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, because you could throw hand grenades in there, but they would get enveloped by the community and they would get fixed because it's about a chorus of voices. Right, in the aggregate, the data, the information, the knowledge, the content, whatever word you want to use, works as a social experiment. The problem we have, I would uh, propose, is we start talking about we're not in the aggregate, we're in the individual. Now we're back to comic book guy, okay? And comic book bot guy is stereotypically sitting in his bedroom or basement or whatever, basement of his mother's house, I guess stereotypically, right? And he's not using the web as in the aggregate. He's using the web in a reinforcing manner. Okay? He's not going to Hannity's website and Rachel Maddow's website. He's going to which one? 
make it easier. He's not going to the Yankees and the Red Sox. He's going to whichever one aligns with his beliefs. If he's a Yankees fan, he's not going to Red Sox to learn about baseball. If he's a conservative, he's not going to Rachel Maddow to learn to broaden his horizons. It's this reinforcing consumption. Okay, again, so in, in London, it would be the Daily Mail or the Guardian. You read one or the other, and you typically don't read the one that has opposing views. So we've got all of this knowledge and all of this content and this community out there, this chorus of voices, but we really find our way that already reinforce our beliefs. Okay? Now, a friend of mine was trying to explain to me the superego, ego, and id stuff, and that was, um, uh, it's a little bit dated. What's that? Yeah, right, a little bit dated and it wasn't really my wheelhouse, but her idea was this, self -reinf this reinforcing consumption mucks with the ego, right? Because you don't, because you are, you are specifically consuming, your super ego gets weaker, right? And you're being told a lot of things that agree with what you already believe. So your ego gets a little bit out of control and can no longer control the id. And again, I don't want to, that's something I want to explore a little more because I thought it was an interesting idea. I don't know if you got any Freudian folks, but you understand, right? If you're just reading the stuff that are, that's like watching Fox News. Whereas I prefer, every, I do the 30 second thing. Fox News, MSNBC. That's a fun evening, isn't it, dear? <laughs> right? But, but there's, no. there's even a, another piece to that because you as an individual are choosing here. But at some point, you start looking at what is being fed to you based off of those choices. Oh, that's a great point, right? So you've got engines out there, right? You know, God forbid if you're ever on Facebook, if you ever leave your Facebook window open and then go to uh, uh, Amazon.com looking for a book, because your next 10 Facebook posts are going, oh, do you really want that chair? Here, we got this chair, and we got this chair. And we got, you know, that's a great point. I hadn't thought of that about the, the automated, you know, and, and you see some of the uh, humorous or, or sad where they get these, um, these chat engines, usually kind of call girly type chat engines. They can get them talking to each other, right? And that's pretty funny because they're robots, right? They're just, they're just chat engines that aren't really there. And when you can get two of them talking to each other, it's pretty funny. Uh, the other direction I thought you were going is there's subgroups, right? So you've got the single consumer. You've got the community at large, the community writ large, the entire World Wide Web, but then you get into these subgroups of like-minded folks that continue to reinforce, right? So it's pretty dangerous out there, to be honest with you, okay? So now we go back to a sense of voice, right? So we got our stream of consciousness. Now it's, oh, the worst, uh, worst uh, pizza ever. And here's a picture, and here's what I think on Facebook, and the ghost is Snapchat. I don't understand Snapchat. Reddit is, can get pretty nasty, right? Reddit is really kind of opinionated, can be kind of, in places, can be kind of vitriolic. Twitter, right? This idea of what's Dan thinking right now? What's Dan thinking right now? What's Dan, you know, every, at every moment of time, what is my stream of consciousness kind of thought? So we get to this deal, right? I, right? Well, we all take pictures of our dinners. I, I, I don't understand. I guess it's better than cats, okay? But we've gotten to this weird place. We're all self-published because, quite frankly, it's so easy. We've all aligned with folks, okay, that reinforce our already, you know, we don't get on, go out on the web and challenge our beliefs. We align ourselves with folks, um, or we, we add ourselves to groups where they are aligned with our beliefs. So you get self-published, sort of begets this sort of self-importance and self-indulgence. Okay, uh, the the uh, the Facebook post here at the bottom is a uh, is a, a high school classmate of my wife and, and mine, who is a self-published used to be called Vanity Press, self-published author of a couple of books, and his Facebook is like a train wreck. I can't take my eyes off of it, and I couldn't find the one where he was saying, a friend of mine say I post too much, but I looked and yesterday I only post 22 times, and I think that's just the right amount of time, right? You get this weird, you know, and he'll always tell you, and I'm not picking on this not to be named person, but oh, now I have 500 friends. Nobody's got 500 friends, right? I mean, on Facebook, whatever those things are, you might have 500 of them. And then you get this, well, as a public service to you, I'm not gonna correct your grammar, I'm only gonna, well, 
Where, where do you come off, right? Where do, how does this happen? How does this self-indulgence, this self-importance happen? Okay? And then you've got the anonymous piece. So now you start trolling, right? Trolling is, you know, firing these anonymous, um, and there, there are countless articles about trolling, some of them pretty funny, okay? But you talk about trolling, trolling begets cyberbullying. Who's this guy? Star Wars kid. Star Wars kid. This poor kid, right? Um, it's, it's, it's originally a, a microphone stand or something. He's doing all the moves from Star Wars 1. Um, and this poor kid, I guess he became famous. But, you know, see, this, in this picture they added the lightsaber effects and whatever else. So there's an interesting, Britain has an interesting law. It's the right to be forgotten. Do we have the right to be forgotten? This kid didn't post this video, or he made the mistake of posting it somewhere where it could be found. He didn't post it. Right. He, he, on a tape, it would, right. So this is the best example of, no, no. I, it, was, I, it was very interesting at the time. No, it, right. At, at the time, I wasn't as, con I didn't think about, you know, the negativity towards right. him that it had, but I thought it was really interesting because of the way it developed this sort of community of people who were modifying the video. And from an artistic standpoint, it was interesting to see sort of like how people make something and build off of it. Build off right. Of it. Um, and, and, oh, that's called, um, oh, it'll come to me in a second. We're getting into the, we're getting into the realm of open educational, open resources, um, mixing. It's called mixing, right, where you take something and add something to it. But the question was, was it yours to begin with, right? Was it yours to begin with? And some folks might be absolutely thrilled that they built something and it bloomed, blossomed into something else. It became a meme. Right? Some people's whole, you know, would be the most wonderful thing in the world if their stuff became a meme. For this guy, maybe not so much. And I thought it was left on a server, but you're saying that it was actually on a videotape. It, does, it doesn't matter. It wasn't his doing, right? He made the mistake of recording himself. And, and you've all seen these things. Uh, people post on Facebook all the time. Oh, I'm teaching my class how viral the, the, you know, repost my picture so I can show how many times it, you know. There's an old joke about, I mean, it was easy being a teenager in our day. You know, because nobody took any pictures. You guys are nuts, right? Everybody taking pictures. And poor, um, well, these athletes these days. You, you think that pro football players 20 years ago weren't acting exactly like Johnny Manziel acts today? Of course they were. There were people out there with the stupid pictures, taking, uh, taking, uh, with the cell phones taking pictures. So this concept of do we have a right to be forgotten? Can this guy, who's a, a law student, I Googled him, right? There's a law, he's a law student now. Can you just say, you know what, wait a minute, guys. You used it without my permission. It was cool for a while. Knock it off. I don't know the answer, okay? But that's another concept. Web 2.0, social presence. Any other kind of ideas related to that? I told you it was going to be a lot of stuff. All right, real quick, we will go through what's it like to teach. With all those things, all that having been said, what can we do as educators, okay? And again, the idea is it's the blob, it's out there. There's not much you're going to do to stem it. The, the, uh, the bonbons are going to what? The bonbons are going to keep coming. There's not much we're going to do, okay? How can we kind of ride the wave as educators? Well, there's this big thing about information literacy. What it means to be information literate. This is what it meant to be information literate in 2009. Okay, the funny thing is, I, I, Half of those things probably don't even exist anymore, right? And yet they continue to come because somebody's always going to have the silver bullet. Somebody's always going to have the next app, right? Somebody's always going to want to sell you something or convince you of something that's going to help your teaching, okay? And we talk about solution-sided decision-making. Your course will be better if only you use this technology. We're making a decision based on a solution, okay? And this idea, inauthentic philosophies, and I don't want to go into the whole philosophy debate, but that's my, that's my deal with some of our workshops here with faculty. I said, you have, you, have, you have an instructional philosophy, you have to be true to that. If nothing else, be true to what you believe is good instruction, and try to ignore the waves of everything else. Assessment, okay? And it's funny that this is an old flip phone, right? So we got the guy looking it up on a flip phone. We got the old note passing. Cha-cha, which I guess doesn't exist anymore. I'll have to take that off. We can always Google something. How about this one? <laughs> Give us your credit card information and tell us the report you need written because we are your number one academic assistance 
firm. Okay? It used to be Craigslist. It used to be you'd go out on Craigslist and, hey, I need a paper based on whatever. Or there were people that would advertise that they would write papers for you. But there you go. There's, there's no, it's unabashed. No shame. No need to study. We'll do it for you. Crazy, right? Scaffolding. We always talk about scaffolding. Well, you've got to provide enough support for the students so they can use these new technologies. Well, except you wind up having to be Mr. Wizard, right? And then scaffolding makes you more like other cultural reference. Anybody? Huh? Sisyphus. Sisyphus. There you go. Pushing the rock, and then the rock comes back down. Okay? It's, it's endless. You cannot, be, you cannot be that kind of support for your students. You, you'll burn yourself out. And that's way back an hour ago. 100 slides ago, that was that deal with Mike Wesch coming back out saying, wait a minute, maybe it's not all about this technology. Because you just flat out run out of gas. Okay? And there you are. You're crazy. It's not going to stop coming. The technology keeps coming. You can't do, uh, you can't keep up with the technology. You can't be expert in all technologies. Uh, and again, you know, we always talk about, uh, a lot of faculty get nervous because they say, oh, the kids are much better at the technology than I am. You know, typically the kids are better at stealing video than you are. <laughs> But in terms of doing a search in EBSCO host, you know, maybe not so much, right? Or information literacy in terms of judging the veracity of content, maybe not so much, right? So what do we do with all these issues? Well, first of all, if you feel like poor Stewie, it's not because you're scared, evil, or lazy, okay? It's just the way of the world. Good news is it's not magic, mystery, or rocket science, okay? It just is. It's the world we live in. The contexts have changed. All those, Luis, right? Literacy, immediacy, ubiquity, social presence. They have changed the rules of the game. So what can we do? There is some research out there. It's growing uh, slowly. And most of the early stuff is not all that good. But you can start looking at some of the research with the, with the um, caveat that as soon as you see this word, best practices, uh, be wary of it. There are models out there. We use the uh, uh, tailored design model here at, at Western with our faculty. And we also use the, um, oh, that's, that's my uh, uh, intentional, intentional design model, I think is what we call this one. I should know it's my model. But anyways, there are some supports out there. There are some research. It's growing. So try and find some of the stuff that helps you. Okay? Remember, we need to rethink a few things, Mike Wesh said. We need to rethink all of these new things. I might argue, though, if you'll excuse me for putting some old white men up here, we might need to rethink some old things. This is Paulo Freire. Uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is his big, um, uh, was his sort of seminal work, right? It's about empowerment. It's about praxis, engagement, involving the students in the educational process. Right? Because the cat's out of the bag with this thing called freeform syntax. They are already out there creating content. They're not interested in you, in a Web 1.0 model, disseminating content. Because they can, they can Google it while they're sitting at you, pretending, sitting in your class, pretending that they're listening to you. Okay? Well, if that's the case, you're not, I mean, we're not going to go backwards on that. So we've got to somehow get the students to embrace that. Okay, and this is this idea of praxis, liberating education. Reading is not walking on the words, it's grasping the soul of them. Miles Horton, Highlander School. We just had the, a little trivia for you, we just had the anniversary of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was at the Highlander School the week before she refused to give up her seat. The Highlander School was a social justice kind of a school in the, uh, not the Ozarks, but the Appalachians. Um, so a little bit of trivia. Okay, this idea of owning it. You gotta own Help your kids own, own their education. Help their kids own the process, their process of learning. Okay? I don't have any best practices for you, but these are some of the concepts that we need to think about. About balance. Balance of power. You are no longer the sage on the stage. And yes, I get how ironic it is for me to have been talking to you for an hour and five minutes telling you these things. Okay? It's about balance. You've got to be willing to cede the power to the students, the power for their own learning, the ownership of their own learning. You have to help guide them to get that. The power of the internet is in its democratization. Okay? And the knowledge of the web is in its aggregate. So I would say you have to disentangle those, you know, we all have the five websites we go to. 
Okay, I go to first thing in the morning, I go to the website of my old hometown, I go to ESPN, I go to Twitter to check out the Raiders uh, uh, transactions, uh, and, and a, you know, a couple others. We all have those five that we go to, right? But we got to make sure that we're trying to consume, we help our kids consume the web in the aggregate because that's where the power is. If we, get too, uh, if we get too aligned with our preconceived notions, that's where we can get into trouble. Okay? Teach them to explore, teach them to challenge, teach them to own. It's, these are big, kind of big concepts, but this is the context we operate in right now. Again, it's not about the technology. You're not going to stem the tide. I would say, and sort of ironically, right, you go back to this idea of literacy. I'm quoting you quotes from 50 and 60 years ago. Uh, Dewey, you know, go look at some of Dewey's quotes, and they're, they're very, very on point for today. Remember, the more effort it takes, the more of you there is in it. Uh, Richard Feynman was one of the smartest men on the planet. His instructional design theory, philosophy was, figure out what they need to know and why they need to know it. And the rest will sort itself out. Right? So again, think about it. Be purposeful about what you do in your classrooms. Be no, know that the, the, the world has changed. We are teaching in the brave new world. Okay? The rules have changed. We've got to figure out how to embrace it. Know that the best laid plans often what? You don't know this one. Best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, right? You're going to make mistakes. You can't keep up with this stuff. And again, back to, back to Mike Wesch saying, you know, oh, you've got to stay on top of the technology and keep feeding your kids these, all these technologies because that's what they want is the technology. You can't keep up with it, okay? Basically, what we're left with is enjoying the ride. Almost made it an hour. I apologize that I haven't. One more piece of, uh, one more. This is the final exam. Anybody? The difference between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0, Mary? One. One. It's that easy, right? It really just is a change of context. Things have changed. We're right in the middle of it. We've got to figure out what we're going to do with that. The last final thought, or a final, final thought is, We've talked about students existing in a brave new world. Is it important? Can I use the term brave new world without a shared knowledge of what I'm talking about? When I say the term brave new world, what comes to mind? This one, right? Whether or not you've read it or not, you kind of get some sense of what it's about. Okay. Does anybody know where the term actually comes from? Because Huxley was referring to something else. That's the part we forget. It's actually the tempest. Who's the, uh, is it Prospero? Who's the wizard in the, it's Prospero, right? He or she, depending on the, the staging of it, talks about the brave new world. So Huxley himself was making an illusion, a reference, based on a common cultural canon with the understanding that everybody back then who would read A Brave New World knew what he was talking about just by titling it this way, knew sort of the implication or the illusion back to the Tempest. So can students exist and learn in a brave new world with having absent the knowledge of what we're talking about with a brave new world. I told you you'd leave with more questions than answers. And the last final thought, this one came up, this was just the other day, right? Sort of along the same ideas. Campuses today are a mashup of 1984 and Lord of the Flies, performed by people who have no idea what we're talking about with those references. With that, sorry, I thought I could get it done in an hour.